and extending Christ's hands to those in need. We are a congregation of hope and an open place of worship that seeks to share the good news beyond the conventional barriers of fellowship. Hi, I'm Brent Scott, a senior pastor at Pulaski Heights United Methodist Church. It is our desire that you will be inspired by today's message of hope for a diverse community in search of God's love.
God of shining clarity, we are so confused. We confuse having security with faith. We confuse sharing our excess with generosity. We confuse having with deserving. Restore us to our rightful minds. Help us know what riches we have and where we are poor indeed. Help us know true penitence and genuine gratitude. In the name of God, our example of generosity, let us share the love and peace of Christ. I invite you to turn in the back of your hymnal to the Psalter, page number 839, as we recite together Psalm 118, verses 14 through 29, with sung response number two. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice, let us rejoice. Let us rejoice and be glad. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice, let us rejoice. Let us rejoice and be glad. The Lord is my strength and my power. The Lord has become my salvation. There are joyous songs of victory in the tents of the righteous. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. The right hand of the Lord is exalted. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. I shall not die, but I shall live and recount the deeds of the Lord. The Lord has chastened me sorely, but has not given me over to death. Open to me the gates of righteousness, that I may enter through them and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord. The righteous shall enter through it. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice, let us rejoice, let us rejoice and be glad. I thank you that you have answered me and have become my salvation. The stone which the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day which the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice, let us rejoice, let us rejoice and be glad. Save us, we beseech you, O Lord. O Lord, we beseech you. Give us success. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. The Lord is God who has given us light. Lead the festal procession with branches up to the horns of the altar. You are my God, and I will give thanks to you. You are my God, I will extol you. O oh, give thanks to the Lord who is good, for God's steadfast love endures forever. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice, let us rejoice, let us you 
You may be seated. I would like to invite our children to come forward for our time with young Christians as we sing. glad you all are here this morning okay in a minute we're going to hear a scripture verse and I think you've heard the story it's about when these friends were taking their friend who couldn't walk anymore uh, was they were taking him to Jesus to see him and it was so crowded in there that they lowered him through the roof do you remember this story have you ever heard it it's a great story so we're going to act it out this morning um all right so everybody come around here everybody get up okay here we go. All right. Let's see. You up here on this corner. You two on this corner. You up here on this corner. Connor, you on that corner. All right. Now, take me. <laughs> Did I hit your head? All right. Here we go. All right. Take me out the doors. Here we go. Um, this isn't working the way I thought it would. Okay. Let's stop. Here. Let's see who we can put down here. All right. Connor, you lay down. All right. You all great? Yeah, you him. Okay. Now, don't drop him. <laughs> I want to keep my job. All right. So, this is kind of what it was like. All right. Now, put him down right here. Because these friends cared so much. You can just lay there. Just enjoy it. <laughs> but these friends cared so much about their friend, and they knew that Jesus could help their friend, that they, they took him to this house because they had enough faith that they thought that Jesus can make our friend well. And so when they got there, it was so crowded that they couldn't even get in the door. And so you know what they did? They crawled up on the roof because in, the, in that area of the world, at that period in, in time, you were able to take pieces of the roof off and see down into the building. So they climbed with their friend all the way up to the roof and then they lowered him down so Jesus could, could be with him. Now, the point of the story is it's a really cool story, but we all have lots of people in our lives that need to experience Jesus' love, don't you think? And so shouldn't we care enough about our friends to make sure they know who Jesus is? Make sense? All right, will you pray with me? Dear God, Help us to have the courage to help us and help our friends to experience you more. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks, boys and girls. Brothers and sisters in Christ, through the sacrament of baptism, we are initiated into Christ's holy church. We are incorporated into God's mighty acts of salvation and given new birth through water and the spirit. All of this is God's gift offered to us without price. This morning, I present Emory Andrew Duke for the sacrament of baptism. On behalf of the whole church, I ask you, Sarah and Stephen, do you renounce the spiritual for forces of wickedness, reject the evil powers of this world, and repent of your sin? And if so, you will say, I do. Do you accept the freedom God gives you to resist evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves? And if so, you will say, I do. 
Do you confess Jesus Christ as your Savior, put your whole trust in His grace, and promise to serve Him as Lord in union with the church, which Christ has opened to people of all ages, nations, and races? And if so, you will say, I do. Will you nurture Andrew in Christ's holy church, that by your teaching and example, that he may be guided to accept God's grace for himself and to pr profess his faith openly and to lead a Christian life? And if so, you will answer, I will. <laughs> Congregation, will you nurture Andrew in the Christian faith and life and include him now in your care? And if so, you will answer, we will. You, I'll tell you what, you are one of the most handsome guys I have seen in a long time. And you are looking at a great congregation. These are your sisters and your brothers in the faith. And we're here today to celebrate your baptism. Yeah, they look great, don't they? Isn't he handsome? I mean, he's got a million dollar smile. You know, your mom grew up in this church, and I remember when she was a little girl. It's shocking how time flies. But uh, you're going to turn out just as well, I can already tell. But this family of faith will help raise you up. They will remind you of your baptism. They will support you, teach you the stories of the Bible until you grow up and you claim that faith for yourself and you live it out. And who knows, perhaps someday you'll bring a, a little boy or a little girl forward for baptism as well. What do you think? I think it might happen. Let me let them get one last look at you. Wonderful, yeah. Lord, pour out your Holy Spirit on this gift of water and on Andrew who receives it. Wash away his sin and clothe him in your righteousness. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. One more time, Andrew. Yeah, come on. Here we go. You ready? All right. Emery, Andrew, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Emery, Andrew, Duke. The Holy Spirit work within you that being born through water and the Spirit, you may be a faithful disciple of Jesus Christ. Amen. It is our joy to welcome our new brother into Christ. Let us join in our response as printed in your bulletin. With joy and thanksgiving, we welcome you into Christ's holy church, for we are all one in Christ Jesus our Lord. We promise to love, encourage, nurture, and support you and to help you know and follow Christ. Lord be with you. Let us pray. God of abundant blessings, as we approach Thanksgiving, we express our gratitude to you for all of the blessings you have given us. We humbly ask for your forgiveness when we take them for granted and pray that we may be a people of gratitude. Most of all, we are so grateful that you are our God and that we are your people. God of compassion, we extend our Christian sympathy to the following, to the family and friends of Kara Franks in her recent death, to Jerry Floyd and Madeline Floyd and their families in the death of their husband and father, Bill Floyd, to Beth Rice and Betty Stuckey and their families in the death of their aunt and sister-in-law, Eloise Bedwell, to Todd Cochran and family in the death of his grandfather, Gordon Souter, 
and to Swan Kohler and family in the death of her son-in-law, Tim Olmsted. God of healing, we pray for your comfort to be with those who have been hospitalized in recent days. Mary Ellen Barnes, Janie Bracey, Paul Foster, Tom McBee, Laura McNabb, James Mitchell, Miriam Rainey, Alan Vickers, and Martha Williams. Hear our prayers for your grace and peace for all of these who have been named in their grief or illness. God of all peoples, we join the worldwide community in prayers for all who are suffering or have suffered loss in the typhoon in the Philippines. May nations join together in providing relief efforts that will ease their suffering. God of joy, we are grateful for the joys in our church family as we extend our congratulations to Collins Cook and Casey Cable and Sarah Cunningham and Tim Anson in their recent marriages. We also give thanks for the opportunity to celebrate together this afternoon in the Forward with Faith Jubilee. It will be good to gather in your name as we all continue to ask, Lord, what do you want to do through me? Gracious God, the cornucopias, pumpkins, and fall leaves are descriptive of our many blessings. May our acts of mercy and compassion be descriptive of our love for your son, Jesus, as we join in the prayer that he taught. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. It is literally impossible to describe in any detail at all the hundreds and hundreds of ministries that flow out of this congregation, Pulaski Heights United Methodist Church, to the community, the state, and the world. But for the last several weeks, we've been trying to highlight a few of our ministries for you. Uh, today, we lift up our young adult ministry, and we celebrate this ministry. The average age of our membership at Pulaski Heights is 35 years old. It is a young adult church, and so I invite you to share and celebrate this wonderful ministry that we have together. Pulaski Heights is the, it's the one consistent thread through my entire story. As a young person, it was the only place where I knew the same people transitioning from elementary school to junior high school to high school. It was the only place that I came home from college and were seeing the same people. And then as a young adult, when I moved back to Little Rock, it was when I came back here that everything has always been home. For me, it's always been a grounding place. I can't, I can't really fake it here because Everybody remember, everybody, there's somebody here <laughs> that knows or remembers the horrible bushy bangs and the different obnoxious <laughs> behaviors. And, and so it's a realness that, um, that I don't think you find when you don't have that kind of longevity. So. The church has been critical in my walk with faith, from being a little kid doing ch children's ministry to being in the youth group to um, college classes that they had when we were back for summer break. 
um, the church has really seen me through that entire process. It's really been a big support system and something that, you know, it's not just going to a place on a Sunday. It's something that you want to be involved in and people that you care about and um, it's a family. When I hear Forward with Faith, I think about the rest of my life. Where am I going to go for the rest of my life and how is faith going to be part of it? And I think that um, right now, I'm, you know, I've had that for my whole life. I've been a member for forever, but now I'm doing it independently. Um, having the atrium where we can welcome new guests is a really great aspect of this campaign. It not only gives you a physical place to welcome them, but it also showcases the, the welcoming spirit that so many people in our church have come to love and something that draws in guests to become members because it sticks with them and I think that that's going to be really important. You know, this is the place for us. We knew it from day one. Um, we sat right back there and about seven or eight people welcomed us and said hi, you know, and we hope to see you next time and, and so we've kind of stayed ever since. Anything we can do to keep going forward, growing the church, um, making things more convenient for, for everybody here as well as the new members is definitely important. We love what the church is about. We love the people we've met. Um, we, we love where our son Carter can grow up with that, that foundation. Um, and so being able years from now looking back and saying, you know, we were part of this, that's something that's very special to us. We have found a Sunday school class that has been a blessing that I didn't, I didn't quite realize I was looking for. And so I find myself, you know, really interested in what we're reading, really interested in what we're doing. We have incredible Sunday school class leaders. And I now feel this whole new passion for what I can learn from the Bible as a book and not just attending church. It's been, it's been a good supplement. It's yeah. definitely been kind of a booster shot for both of us. We were welcome with open arms and it's been one of those things where we don't, we don't ever know what we do without it because it's really been a very nice addition to uh, our spiritual lives. Mm -hmm. There's so many options. That, that's what I think what separates us from from a lot of churches is you know there's the contemporary service. If you, it, it's all about finding your role. There's so many ways to find what makes you comfortable. Not everyone is comfortable in the traditional service. Um, not everyone is co is comfortable in the contemporary service. But there's so many outlets that the church provides to make you feel comfortable and find that role where you fit in that place because. What unites every bit of every group that is associated with the church is that common bond, a common message of of what it is we're trying to accomplish as a church as a whole and what we're trying to believe in, and that's the word of Jesus. You're invited to stand for the reading of the scripture. Mark 2, 1 through 12 in the New Testament. When he returned to Capernaum after some days, it was reported that he was at home. So many gathered around that there, were, there was no longer room for them, not even at the front door. And he was speaking the word to them. Then some people came, bringing to him a paralyzed man carried by four of them. And when they could not bring him to Jesus because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him, and after having dug through it, they let down the mat on which the paralytic lay. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now some of the scribes were sitting there questioning in their hearts. Why does this fellow speak in this way? It is blasphemy. Who can forgive sins but God alone? At once, Jesus perceived in his spirit that they were discussing these questions among themselves. And he said to them, Why do you raise such questions in your hearts? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, stand up, take your mat, and walk, but so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, stand up, take your mat, and go to your home. And he stood up and immediately took the mat and went out before all of them so that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, We have never seen anything like this. The Word of God for the people of God. You may be seated.
it stands as one of the most impactful moments in American history. Fifty years ago, this Friday, November 22nd, I sat in a fourth grade classroom. And shortly after lunchtime, my teacher was called out. And when she returned a few moments later, her eyes were brimming with tears. President Kennedy has been shot, she told our class, and he's dead. And though I was only nine years old at the time, I still recall the feelings of disbelief and shock and confusion and fear that swept over me. And those feelings all settled into a, to an overwhelming sense of sadness as together with my teacher and classmates, we prayed for our nation and we prayed for the Kennedy family. Upon uh, arriving at home that afternoon, climbing off a school bus, I found that same atmosphere of grief in my household. I could see it on the faces of my parents and my siblings. It was a painful, difficult, horrific time. And over the next days, America would come of age. America would come of age, and so would a relatively new medium called television. For four consecutive days, all the major networks, and there were only three at that time, but all the major networks offered continual coverage of the assassination, the funeral, and the investigation surrounding President Kennedy. Even now, even now, I, I see that experience through the lens of grainy black and white footage. Lyndon Johnson being sworn into the presidency as Jackie Kennedy looked on wearing the same bloody dress that she had had on since that morning in the Dallas motorcade. The Kennedy son, John John, saluting the caisson that carried his father's casket. And the looks of sheer anguish and pain and grief as cameras panned streets, crowded streets across this nation as people grieved the loss of Camelot. The assassination death of President Kennedy was also a coming-of-age experience for me. In fact, it was my first ever realization that the world can be brutal and cruel and deadly. But it also, this moment also served as a wonderful lesson in the power of community. It was a great lesson in the kind of healing and wholeness that can take place when a nation or a family or, or a church come together in faith and love. Huge, huge impactful moment in my life and in the life of this country. When he returned to Capernaum, after some days, it was reported that he was at home. So many gathered around that there was no longer room for them, not even in the front door. And he was speaking the word to them. Then some people came, bringing to him a paralyzed man carried by four of them. And when they could not bring him to Jesus because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him. And after having dug through it, they let down the mat on which the paralytic lay. Can you imagine being in such demand that people would literally dig through a roof in order to get to you? Jesus Christ led the most impactful life, the most impactful existence in the course of human history. Jesus, life, death, and resurrection literally split history in half. And he forever changed, forever changed the destiny of humanity. This impactful life, this powerful life, we receive just the tiniest glimpse as we look at and explore this story of the healing of the paralyzed man. 
And this story is told to us not in grainy black and white images, but in rich and vivid, colorful detail. Jesus has just returned to his home base in Capernaum from, from a preaching mission, a preaching tour across Galilee, where he has also healed a leper. News of Jesus' great success precedes him. And by the time he arrives in Capernaum, at the home where he is staying, perhaps, perhaps the home of, of one of his disciples, people are already gathering around. They follow Jesus into the home. They crowd in. They fill the rooms. They begin to surround the house. They lean into the open windows. They wedge themselves into the doorway. And still people come, even as Jesus speaks the good news to them. Enter suddenly stage left a group of four persons carrying a, a paralytic on a mat toward Jesus because they are convinced that Jesus can make their friend whole again. When they arrive at the house, they're unable to enter. It's, it's full. There's no room for them. The people wedged in the door refuse to move, to allow these people in. But they will not be put off. And after they try and try, they finally climb an exterior stair step to the flat roof, which was common in that day and time. They find themselves on the roof, carrying their friend, their paral the paralytic, mat and all. And when they reach the top of the roof, they begin to scratch and claw and dig with their hands through the roof. The thatch, the straw, the sticks, the, the beams. They dig and dig and dig until finally a tiny hole appears. Light shoots up from it. They look down and they see the crowd below. Debris begins to fall on the head of Jesus and, and those who are gathered, but it doesn't deter these four. They continue digging and clawing and digging until finally they create a hole that is large enough to literally lower the mat with their paralyzed friend on it before Jesus. And what follows is exactly, exactly what these friends had hoped and prayed for. Jesus makes their friend whole. He makes their friend whole. First, first he commends the four on the roof for their, their faith, their tenacity, their belief in God's healing power. They, he lauds them for their, for their commitment to bringing their friend to Christ. And then Jesus turns to the paralyzed man himself and he offers forgiveness of sins, which sounds rather strange, don't you think? But in reality, it's, it's what we all need and want most, isn't it? We want to know that no matter what happens in our lives, no matter how broken we are, how sick we are, how far away we are, there is a God who loves us, embraces us, and accepts us as we are. Jesus heals the soul of his paralytic. And then Jesus heals his body as well. Stand, he tells the paralytic. Take up your mat and, and go home. And the paralytic takes up his mat. He stands and he walks out praising God and giving thanks for this new life, this wonderful new life, this new lease on life that he has received. Now, it's not all pleasant because there are scribes there in the house. And we know that wherever Jesus turns up in a public speaking engagement or a healing session, that the scribes and the Pharisees are usually present, looking, monitoring, watching what Jesus is doing. And they're not thrilled at all with Jesus' actions in this place because, quite frankly, quite frankly, the impact uh, of Jesus' freewheeling, spirit-led ministry always seems to trump their self-righteous religiosity. And so they hate him. Think about this scene. Think about this image of these friends digging down, not up, down, in order to reach Jesus. It's absolutely unbelievable. Unbelievable. Because prior to the coming of Jesus, prior to the appearance of Jesus in flesh, God was viewed as 
not down there, but up there, out there, away, removed, aloof, distant, unattainable, untouchable, behind the Holy of Holies, veiled with a curtain. But Jesus changed all that. Jesus changed all of that. And, and in Jesus, God has come close to us. Even now, God is as close to us as the, the earth we dig our hands into. God is as close to us as our own heartbeat. The impact of Jesus Christ has forever changed our lives and the world. Now I know, I know that this, uh, this story of the healing of the paralytic paralytic has absolutely nothing to do with us today it surely has nothing to say to the church does it i mean we would never block our doorways and windows would we we would never keep people away from pulaskiites we're an open church we welcome everybody we greet everybody we want them here there is a place for you you're invited to come and and join us heck we'll give you a whole pew if you want one especially the ones at the front But empty seats, empty seats are not always an indication of a welcome. And there are so many other ways. There are so many ways we can throw up barricades and walls to keep people away from the community of faith, away from Jesus. We can become so wrapped up in our circle of friends, our Sunday school class, our our, our our women's circle that we fail to see. The stranger, the seeker, the sojourner who desperately wants to be a part of this community of faith. We can become so set in our ways and in our traditions that new visions and new dreams are poo-pooed and, and dismissed. We can become so self-satisfied that we literally cannot see the spiritual and physical barricades and boundaries we put up for people in the world. If you don't believe me, I want you to try a little experiment. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to visit the church some weekday morning or afternoon, but I want you to pick a rainy day, a rainy day. And I want you to come with the mindset that you've never been here before. You're not a member of this congregation. You've never been on site. You're attending a meeting in our facility. I also want you to come with a mindset that you have some kind of physically limiting condition. Here's what I want you to do. I don't want you to think of yourself as being in a wheelchair. And so you pull up on a weekday, rainy day, in front of Pulaski Heights. You go to the front parking lot because that's what we do when we don't know where we're going. We always come to the front of a place, don't we? I do. You park your car, you get out, you climb in your wheelchair, you roll across Woodlawn for the front door. Well, where's the front door? Well, sure, it's the sanctuary. Here's the church, here's the steeple. But there's steps, and, and the sanctuary's locked during the week anyway. You turn around, you're already beginning to feel damp, but you roll your way down the sidewalk until you come to a lovely entrance on on, on Woodlawn, uh, next to our columbarium garden. It's light and open. You go into the door. There's a beautiful St. Francis statue greeting you. It's lovely. But you look around. It's as far as you can go because there are steps everywhere. Steps up, steps down. No way to get to the rooftop. Now already soaked to the skin and feeling perhaps like you're not really wanted here. You go back outside, roll back down the sidewalk, and there it is, ah, at last. There is a wheelchair ramp that goes into a side door that's not readily visible from the street. You find yourself in a hallway lined with doors. It looks like you're in Alice in Wonderland. What door do you take? But you keep making your way in your chair down the hallway until at last you come to the Welcome Center, your destination, you're there. But no. From that point, a friendly voice tells you that now you must go down another hallway, take an elevator to the ground floor, go outside, cross a brick cobblestone area to Wesley Hall, which is your destination. I do believe, I do believe it would be easier to claw oneself through a rooftop than to make this journey. 
I mean, it's possible that a paralytic could die on his mat here trying to get to a destination. Don't get me wrong, I love this church. It's wonderful, it's godly, it's generous. I, I love you. You're, the ministries of Pulaski Heights astound me every day. I'm always touched and overwhelmed because truly this church does go out in the world. We teach our children, we train up our youth, we feed the hungry, we clothe the naked, we literally visit the prisons. It's, it's all there, it's all wonderful. And on this particular day, I'm especially lifting up the ministry of one of our, one of our longtime Pulaski Heights members, Pamela Hoover. I don't know if you know it, but months ago, Pamela began bringing children from her neighborhood to Pulaski Heights on Sunday morning, children who would never have a church home. She brings them to Sunday school and worship and children's choir. She's faithful, and over the months, what started was one child has increasingly grown to more and more children. Now the children in the neighborhood are inviting each other. And so today, November 17th, for the first time ever, Pamela has engaged the use of a 12-passenger van so she doesn't have to make quite so many trips. I would say that Pam Hoover has taken up her mat and she is riding it like a flying carpet. Over 24 years ago, I preached my first sermon in this sanctuary. I was a brand new, young associate, just on site, when my senior pastor placed me in the pulpit after one week. I was horrified. I was terrified. I was frightened to death. I, I didn't think I could do it. I, I, I'd never been in a church this size. It was so large. It was so overwhelming. The, the TV lights, the, the people, the, the stress, the, the pressure. I, I just knew I couldn't do it. A really wonderful doctor friend in this congregation did give me a little pill to take on Sunday morning. <laughs> but it didn't help. It didn't help. And before the service began as I stood out there and looked into this place. For all the world, it could have been St. Peter's Basilica for me. But standing in that very cramped narthex, pushed against the wall by acolytes and choir members and clergy persons and ushers and members rushing off the street to get a bulletin and to find a place in this sanctuary, my claustrophobia kicked in big time and I began to perspire no sweat bullets and bullets it was a very shaky beginning for me quite frankly the only thing that kept me from bolting the next day was the love and support and affirmation and encouragement that I received from this congregation this church has made a huge impact on my life. And so now, let all of us go forward with faith as we impact the lives of those who will come after us. I say to you, take up your mat and go to your home. And he stood up and immediately took the mat and went out before all of them so that they were all amazed and glorified God saying, we have never seen anything like this. Amen.
Please be seated. As our ushers come forward, know the offering you made last week empowered ministry within our congregation, without our, in our, throughout our state, and throughout the world in response to the needs of our community. And it also helps support the work of ministries beyond our local church that reach people who are in desperate need to hear the good news of love and redemption. Will you pray with me? Heavenly God, you speak to us through the words of your prophets, but also through your revelation in the world you've created and the people who inhabit it. You've held up a vision for a heavenly kingdom you desire for us where suffering is gone, compassion is present, and justice reigns. May the gifts we offer this morning, the service we offer throughout the week, and the prayers of blessing and gratitude we lift with each breath help usher that kingdom into our world and into our hearts. We ask this in the name of Christ, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Thank you for joining us today at Pulaski Heights United Methodist Church. And I hope you enjoyed our worship service. May the peace, joy, and love of God be with you.